Uh, so next, we'll talk about radiation therapy, what's new in localized disease. Christina Henson, our, uh, one of our radiation oncologists who specializes in GU oncology, will be uh, giving this talk. There's been a lot of new kind of exciting data in radiation for prostate cancer in the past year, so all my slides are new except for one. Um, that's just kind of an important review. So um, I will get started. I don't have any disclosures, unfortunately, yet. Um, so professional practice gap. Um, in, in our field, um, we're working to shorten the length of radiation treatment for prostate cancer, and that's been highly successful. Um, this needs to translate out into the community a little bit better. Um, and so that would be one of the big practice gaps that, that we see. Um, that hypofractionated radiation is pretty much an option for um, almost, if not every patient that we treat, and that needs to be um, translated into the clinic. Um, and then another question that hadn't been answered is what is the impact of irradiating the whole pelvis, including the lymph nodes, versus just treating the prostate or the prostate bed as far as toxicity? And we finally do have some data um, on that this year, thanks to um, Europe. So, um, Let's see. Okay, so this is the only slide that's the same as last year. Um, hypofractionation, what does that mean? That basically means shortening the course of radiation treatment, um, you know, from what it would have been. So traditionally, a full course of treatment for prostate cancer is going to be nine weeks of daily treatment, so 45 treatments. Um, it's very standard now that we condense treatment into 20 to 28 fractions. Um, and this has shown equivalent outcomes in four randomized trials now um, in early and low intermediate risk prostate cancer and is now being looked at also in high risk prostate cancer. So this is pretty much deemed to be the standard of care now for um, you know early and, and low intermediate risk prostate cancer. Um, and probably what, what we all should be doing for our patients. Um, like I said, five-year disease-free survival has been excellent in the order of about 90% um, on the trials. Um, and this is what last year half of expert GU radiation oncologists were, were doing, and so that's probably even higher now this year. Um, Ultra-hypofractionation is what we're looking at now, and that refers to um, condensing, it, condensing it even further. So you guys mostly probably know what SBRT is, and that refers to radiation therapy that's done in five or fewer treatments. Ultra-hypofractionation is kind of that middle ground. It's not quite SBRT. It's more than five fractions, but it's less than um, the 20 to, to 30 fractions. Um, so it's defined as being more than five gray per fraction. Um, this clearly would have a lot of benefits to the patient if it pans out. It's much more convenient, less missed work, um, hopefully less fatigue with treatment, less travel if they um, don't live locally. Um, potential advantages from a biologic standpoint are a um, higher therapeutic ratio, so more damaging to tumor cells while hopefully um, more sparing of the normal tissues, and this is based on the um, what we think is to be the low alpha beta ratio of, of prostate cancer, and that's just a metric that refers to um, radiosensitivity. Um, and before this year, we had um, a couple of good non randomized trials showing good outcomes with ultra hypofractionation. We have the NRG G005 study underway that's looking at um, SBRT, which is five fractions of radiation versus hypofractionated radiation. So notice that the control arm now on this study is hypofractionated, um, 28 fractions. So we're, we're currently enrolling on that study here. Um, in the meantime, uh, Denmark and the Netherlands have resulted on this hypo-RTPC trial, which isn't quite SBRT at seven fractions. Um, you know, SBRT has to be five or fewer, but, but very similar. So very short course of radiation. It is a randomized control phase three um, non-inferiority trial um, that randomized patients to either full course, you know, traditional radiation or the seven fraction radiation. These were all intermediate um, and high risk prostate cancer. Um, caveat to that is only 11% were high risk. We consider this an intermediate risk trial. Um, the maximum PSA allowed was 20. Um, 
and impressive five-year fail failure-free survival of 84% in both arms with um, pretty low toxicity rates. Um, so urinary toxicity at one year was slightly higher on the short course, but that had evened out by um, five years. So just 5% rate of grade two or higher. So grade two, meaning that it's bothersome and is requiring probably some sort of medical intervention, but not a surgical intervention. So conclusions, and what they concluded um, in their analysis from this is, um, you know, this was a good trial. They included 1,200 patients. They met their non-inferiority non margin um, easily. Um, and they conclude that ultra-hypofractionated radiation is non-inferior. Um, the early effects are slightly more pronounced, but late toxicity is the same and is low. Um, and that this is relevant probably for patients with low and intermediate risk disease, not really um, quite ready to make that leap to applying to high-risk patients yet. And that con conventional fraction is now considered to be unconventional. And I would kind of question um, if you're routinely seeing patients from a radiation oncologist who's telling them that their only option is 45 treatments, I would um, find someone else to refer to. Um, and the toxicity on this trial was actually lower than the toxicity on the, the four big um, hypofrac conventionally hypofractionated studies. Um, this is the exact same trend that's kind of happening in other areas, other cancer sites that we see, so breast cancer. Same thing. It used to be six to seven weeks of treatment, and we're now routinely doing it in three to four weeks, or for early stage patients, even just one week of treatment. So um, this is something that we're moving toward um, broadly. So um, what about ultra-hypofractionation for high-risk patients? Um, there are a couple um, interesting low number, but, but um, very interesting studies with, with compelling results that were resulted in the last year. The top one, I'm not going to try to say the name of that trial, but it was 30 gray and five fractions, um, and they did include the seminal vesicles. Um, the second trial, the Saturn trial, um, the subtle difference between the two, they both were 45 gray and five fractions to the prostate, but the Saturn trial did include the pelvic nodes and the seminal vesicles, and the top trial just did seminal vesicles, and the doses there were slightly different, which may explain the slightly different toxicity profiles here. The top trial did have some increased um, GI and sexual toxicity. Could that have been because they were giving 30 gray to the seminal vesicles versus the second study, which was giving 25 gray to the seminal vesicles, possibly? Um, but these biochemical um, failure rates are pretty impressive for high-risk prostate cancer. So Saturn trial at four years of follow-up of their 30 patients, they had no biochemical failures. Um, and then the top trial, they had 5.6 years of follow-up and only had a 15% failure rate. So this is pretty comparable to the results of the ASCEND RT trial, which looked at external beam radiation to the whole pelvis with an LDR brachy boost. And at 10 years, they had an 83% progression-free survival um, rate. So... Um, with my bias and with these data, I would argue that radiation is the best recommendation for patients with high-risk prostate cancer. Um, regarding quality of life and toxicity after radiation, um, in the past we thought, well, it probably depends on whether we're treating the lymph nodes because clearly the field size is going to be different there. We're treating a much larger area if we're including lymph nodes. Um, but no one had ever really um, reported on that. So, and. In our field, we don't really know yet if we need to be treating lymph nodes or not. Even in high-risk patients, the data is very mixed. Um, so there are some nomograms. The Memorial Sloan Kettering um, group has some pretty good nomograms for predicting nodal risk that kind of help guide our treatment decisions and probably yours as well. Um, but in the end, we still don't know if there's a benefit to treating nodes. Um, so if there's something that's of questionable benefit, we definitely want to know What's the toxicity that we're causing when we do decide to do it? Um, so, um, and especially in the area of IMRT or more um, modern day radiation, the trials that had commented on toxicity of pelvic radiation were all using old techniques and did show higher toxicity rates. Um, so, again, um, England looked at this, the NHS. 
don't know what we would do without Europe sometimes. Um, and so just a reminder of how we grade toxicity. Here's the RTOG EORTC scale. So typically grade one is going to be really minor or subclinical. might be something that, you know, see some bladder abnormalities on scope, but the patient's not reporting any um, complaints. Grade two, I usually think of maybe starting them on Peridium or Flomax for symptoms, and then grade three is going to be patients that are requiring a procedure. So here are the outcomes. You can see that these two lines are prostate-only IMRT versus um, pelvic lymph node and prostate IMRT, and the toxicity curves are overlapping. Um, so it actually seems as though um, the toxicity is not much different when we include nodes, so that's reassuring for us. Um, so this was, again, like I said, the first study to include IMRT exclusively and also had a relative, relatively high volume of patients. Um, I also found this report very interesting. So recurrences that are limited to pelvic nodes, um, where do they occur, um, and how can that help to guide our management decisions? So um, this group mapped out um, where nodal recurrences were happening, and it turns out that 50% of them are outside of the true pelvis. So 50% of them are in the common iliacs or higher. Um, so as far as what a standard radiation field looks like or what a standard lymph node dissection is um, including, um, this might be kind of surprising to, to us to learn this. Um, when we do opt to treat the pelvis in radiation, the superior extent of our field is kind of um, user dependent. Some people will put it at mid SI joint. Some people put it at the top of um, L5. And then some people, instead of relying on bony surrogates, will actually follow um, the iliacs up to where they occur in that person. So for most people, the um, you know, the common iliacs are at about L4. Um, so what they, you know, took away from these results is that if we address the common iliac nodes in addition to the true pelvic nodes, we'll be covering about 75% of nodal relapses. So we'll still be missing 25 to 30%, um, but we're missing a lot of them right now um, with, with both of our techniques. Um, so... They conclude that a limited or standard extended salvage lymph node dissection is insufficient and not recommended, and that to maximize treatment outcomes for these patients, um, either elective nodal radiation extending up to L4 or higher, or a super extended um, lymph node dissection should be preferred. Um, interestingly, and I didn't make slides about this, but um, regarding the coverage of, of the pelvic nodes with radiation, there was a big abstract presented at ASTRO last year called the SUPPORT trial, which was RTOG0534. That was looking at um, biochemical failure after prostatectomy and treating just the prostate bed versus prostate bed with short-term ADT versus treating the prostate bed and the pelvis with short-term ADT. Um, and they noticed um, survival differences between each group. So. 71% five-year progression from failure if we just treat the prostate bed versus 87% if we also include the nodes and add short-term ADT. So for us, that's the strongest um, evidence that we have that we should be including pelvic nodes in patients who are at high risk or who have recurred biochemically. Um, and then another big um, thing that's been talked about lately is how do we address METs? Can patients with Limited metastatic burdens still be cured, and there's a lot of evidence pointing towards yes, but some of the evidence is mixed. So um, kind of the current consensus statement from a, a group of experts that was published in Onco Target recently was that it should be, you know, discussed in a multidisciplinary setting and that um, some patients um, definitely can benefit from METS-directed therapy if they have reduced disease burden. <clears throat> so a little bit more on quality of life and toxicity after radiation. Um, I, I kind of talked about this um, a little bit in the setting of, of um, the hypofractionated studies, but what about in the setting of post-prostatectomy radiation? Um, 
exclusively looking at patients who are treated with modern techniques of IMRT. Um, and uh, recently reported was this big report from the University of Chicago um, looking at a really detailed breakdown of patient reported quality of life and late side effect profiles um, following salvage radiation. Um, and so they looked at factors that are associated with worse quality of life or toxicity, and some of these are things that we can control and some are not. So higher BMI, older age, receipt of hormone therapy and tobacco history, we can't do much about, but um, longer time between surgery and post-prostatectomy radiation actually resulted in um, a decline in quality of life, as did the total dose of radiation and the dose to the bladder. Um, so that gives us some information on maybe what's our um, tipping point for bladder toxicity that we cause. And also um, included some nice charts that can be used on counseling patients for their risk. So based on, um, you know, their BMI and what is their baseline functions, et cetera, um, here are some um, kind of estimated quality of life outcomes that can be given to a patient. Um, and then back here, another interesting thing that they showed was that recovery of urinary function actually continues to occur during radiation, which is something that was classically taught in our field was that you wait for patients continence to recover as much as it's going to before starting radiation, but they actually didn't see that that mattered and that continence levels continued to improve through and after treatment. This is just showing that um, the side effects were pretty, uh, stayed pretty level throughout treatment. Um, so radiation for bone pain is my last topic. Um, this is of most interest to radiation oncologists. Know that you can refer patients to us for bone pain, but there are several different ways that we can deliver the radiation treatment, ranging from one fraction in a dose that would be considered palliative to 10 fractions in a dose that's considered palliative to one fraction in a, in a dose that is considered and hoped to be ablative, um, which would be more used in those patients with oligometastatic disease where we are aiming to give them a survival benefit. Um, so there's a lot of studies looking at what are the best ways to dose fractionate for bone mets. And it seems that the higher the dose we deliver um, and the fewer number of treatments, the longer duration of pain-free survival that they have. Um, and so this is just delving into that a little bit. So the take-home point would be consider single fraction SBRT for patients with bone mets who do have long estimated survivals. So my conclusions are um, hypofractionated radiation is the current standard of care for most patients getting definitive radiation for prostate cancer. Um, there's emerging evidence for curative intent treatment of patients with oligometastatic disease. Um, and one, can should, one should consider METS-directed therapy in the form of either surgery or radiation, um, and that including pelvic nodal radiation to prostate or prostate bed fields um, does not add significant toxicity and may, in fact, improve outcomes. 